Welcome to the IFRS Foundation podcast. My name is Claire Short and I am part of the communications team. Today I am joined by Hans Hoevorst and Sue Lloyd, Chair and Vice Chair of the International Accounting Standards Board, respectively. We'll be talking today about developments arising from the most recent board meeting, held virtually from the 23rd to the 25th of June 2020. But before we get into those details, I'd like to touch on the topic of the insurance contract standard. Hans, we issued the final amendments to IFRS 17 at the end of June. Can you fill us in on this milestone? Yeah, these are truly the final, final amendments. We uh, we have worked hard to help the markets prepare for the introduction of IFRS 17, uh, working with market participants and supervisors to ensure a smooth transition to this uh, new groundbreaking, but also complicated standard. The fundamental principles introduced with the issuance of IFRS 17 in May 2017, they remain really unaffected. Uh, The amendments were really designed to reduce costs by simplifying some requirements in the standard to make financial performance a bit easier to explain and to give some extra time for uh, an easier transition by deferring the effective date of the standard to 2023. So main message is all the fundamental principles remain intact, but hopefully uh, these changes will these amendments will make uh, life a little bit easier uh, for uh, the insurers. And anyone interested in finding out more about the IFRS 17 final amendments can visit the news or project pages on ifrs.org. And let me just add that our insurance team, which works like clockwork, has done a fantastic job in getting this out all in time. Often uh, we have delays in, in, in finalizing our standards. This was all done in time given the importance of giving people clear uh, implementation guidance uh, as soon as possible. So, yeah. fantastic job. And I also the, think all it's... All the more it's, impressive in this environment, I'd say, yeah? Absolutely. All, that's exactly what mm-hmm. I was going to say, is all the more impressive because we are working from home and working remotely and all of that sort of thing. So, well done to the to the team. And as I said, anyone interested in finding out more can visit ifres.org. Moving on to June's board meeting, let's look at some of the projects discussed. The first of these is the time-sensitive eyeball project. Sue, can you tell us more about the developments here? Sure. So, as people might remember, in April this year, we published a consultation document on some proposed amendments to some standards to deal with eyeball reform uh, with a 45-day comment period to reflect the urgency of these changes. And sort of at a high level, these amendments aim to address issues that affect financial statements when changes are made to contracts as a result of eyeball reform. So at the June meeting, we discussed the feedback that we um, got on the on the consultation and made a number of decisions. And I was going to go through just a, a few of those. So the high level outcome is that we mainly confirmed the proposals in the exposure draft at this meeting and that reflected the fact that there was really a very high level of agreement with what we had proposed in the exposure draft. So in particular in relation to modifications uh, we confirmed that where contracts are changed in a manner that's necessary as a consequence of eyeball reform and where economic equivalence is maintained the change in rate would be reflected like an updated floating rate for items that are measured at amortised cost. So we'll make some changes to try and improve the clarity of those proposed requirements, but really no substantive changes from what we proposed in that area. We also proposed a number of changes in relation to hedge accounting, where again, we mainly confirmed what was proposed in the exposure draft, but we did make a few adjustments and I'm going to touch on those briefly. Anyone who's really interested in hedge accounting will know that the devil's always in the detail. So do look at the specific papers, but I'll try and give you a flavour of some of the key points where we made some adjustments. So a number of respondents thought that the wording in the exposure draft might have implied that hedges could only be adjusted to refer to new benchmark rates and no other changes could be made. So they felt that the hedge accounting relief seemed narrower than the modification relief. And we agreed with that. So we've decided to clarify the words to make it clear that basically if a hedge is adjusted just to reflect the necessary changes from eyeball reform, hedge accounting will continue. In fact, it must continue. And that essentially the range of changes that we accept as being economically equivalent for the modification test would also be accepted as adjustments for continuing hedge accounting. 
We also agreed to adjust the 24-month test that we'd proposed in the exposure draft to deal with the separate <coughs> identifiability criteria for hedge accounting and agreed that that 24-month test should begin from the date that an entity designates a particular alternative benchmark rate as a hedge risk for the first time. So it will be a buy rate test for an entity. Some people in their comment letters said that the exposure draft seemed to only contemplate continuation of hedge accounting when the contractual terms of a hedging instrument are modified. And they pointed out that in some cases, the form of the change could be different. You really need to look at the paper to look at the specifics, but broadly speaking, the board agreed that the amendments should enable hedge accounting to continue, even if the changes are affected by means other than modifying the contract, but only if the economic outcome is equivalent to modifying the contract for an alternative benchmark rate and the original hedging instrument isn't de-recognised. The final point I'll make on hedge accounting relates to everyone's favourite topic, transition. Those of you following the project will know that the board took the fairly unusual step of proposing that the amendments for hedge accounting apply retrospectively, including requiring that hedges that were discontinued solely as a result of eyeball reform should be required to be reinstated. Now, we propose that to try and be helpful, but some people noted that in some cases it might just not be practicable or it might actually be unhelpful because, for example, they'd taken a hedging instrument and put it into a new hedge or the hedged item might not exist anymore. It might have been de-recognised by the time the amendments apply. So we listened to that and we agreed with these comments. Now, we had always intended that the reinstatement of hedges would be subject to impracticability, but we'll make that clearer. But we also agreed that in addition, the requirement to restate would be subject to an entity still pursuing the same risk management objective for a hedging relationship and meeting the qualifying criteria at the date when these new amendments are applied. So what does that mean? It means that, for example, if you've used the hedging instrument in a different hedge, you don't have to reinstate the old hedge. Now, lastly on IBOR, uh, disclosure. Again, we largely confirmed the proposals in the exposure draft, but we did get some feedback that in some areas people thought that maybe the disclosures were a bit too prescriptive and a bit burdensome. So we've tried to address that. So the first thing is we confirmed that comparative information isn't required. Um, we also decided to adjust the disclosure that we proposed in the exposure draft that would have required that the carrying amount of financial instruments subject to reform be disclosed by significant benchmark. In response to the feedback, we agreed to adjust the disclosure to make it really more objective based and a bit less prescriptive. So rather than specifically requiring information by carrying amount, we will require that quantitative information be provided that will enable investors to understand the magnitude of financial instruments remaining that still are subject to transition for alternative benchmark rates, but really to leave it more open for entities to decide you know, how best to provide those disclosures. So last thing on this is just to say that 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 was almost the end of the eyeball re-deliberations. The staff again did really well, particularly in this difficult environment, bringing us pretty much all of the papers that we needed for the re-deliberations. There's an outstanding issue to deal with accounting for qualifying hedging relationships and groups of items, which we plan to discuss at our next meeting, along with any other remaining sweep issues. So we're still on track to get this done on our original timetable. That's great, Sue. And can you fill us in while we have you on, on the line, classification of liabilities as current or non-current? Yeah, this is a project to deal with the classification of liabilities as current or non-current in accordance with IAS 1. In May, we published an exposure draft proposing to delay the effective date of those amendments from annual reporting periods beginning on the 1st of January 2022 proposing moving that out a year to the 1st of January 2023. At this meeting, we looked at the feedback to that exposure draft. It was largely supportive. And so at this meeting, we gave the staff uh, the green light to go ahead and draft this amendment, which we plan to issue in July. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, let's turn our attention to disclosure initiatives. Hans, can you give us a little more information on the context of this project and catch us up on what was discussed at the recent meeting? Yeah, so we discussed uh, two of the remaining projects on the umbrella of the disclosure initiative, which we have 
been working on for a couple of years, all about improving the, uh, the quality of the information disclosed in general purpose financial statements. So at this month's meeting, we discussed accounting policies and targeted standards level review of disclosures. And the first of uh, these two projects, so about accounting policies, aims to help stakeholders improve accounting policy disclosures for investors. We looked at an analysis on whether material accounting policy information can include standardized information and information that duplicates or summarizes the requirements of IFRS uh, standards. We agreed that accounting policy information that is standardized information or information that duplicates or summarizes the requirements of IFRS standards can be material and should be disclosed. Uh, so our plan will be to issue the uh, final amendments towards the end of the year. Then the second uh, disclosure initiative project is the uh, targeted standards level review. And this is all to help stakeholders improve the usefulness of disclosures for investors. So the board has developed guidance for itself to use when developing and drafting disclosure objectives and requirements in the future. And then we subsequently tested this guidance by applying it to the disclosure sections of IAS 19, uh, employee benefits, and to IFRS 13, fair value measurement. And at this meeting, we gave the staff the green light to draft an exposure draft, which we plan to publish early in 2021. Thank you, Hans. Sue, can you tell us about the maintenance issues that came up at this month's meeting? Sure, and unusual because it was sort of two decisions not to do something at the moment, which is unusual. So firstly, we discussed accounting for the sale of a subsidiary to a customer and decided not to add a narrow scope standard setting project to our work plan to address disposal of subsidiaries that some consider to be revenue-like. That would have been looking at a, a pretty narrow population of of companies that are subsidiaries with particular characteristics, and we decided not to do that now. Secondly, we discussed feedback on a consultation we conducted a few years ago related to changes in accounting policy that arise from agenda decisions. We proposed a couple of years ago to lower the threshold for retrospective application. We decided not to proceed with this project because there really was very little support for it from stakeholders and looking at the costs of uh, standard setting relative to the, the, the marginal benefits that it seemed we would get, we decided we shouldn't do this. Thank you, Sue. Uh, that wraps up the items that were discussed at this month's meeting, but there are two news items we would like to touch on before saying goodbye for, for this episode. First up, two of our long-serving members finished their terms this month, and in August, we'll welcome a new member. Hans, can you tell us some more? Yeah, so we had a little bit of a sad ending of uh, this um, board meeting because we had to say farewell and also virtually farewell. We were not even able to uh, to shake their hands to Chang Wu Su and Gary Kaberek, two very good board members that served with us for eight years. Chang Wu is our, uh, was our Korean uh, board member um, with an academic background, very hardworking board member who um, it was the first Korean board member. Uh, I'm, I also told him I'm sure that there will be future Korean board members given the strength of the accounting profession in, in, in Korea. And Gary Kaberek, a, an American board member with a very strong preparer background who didn't just look at preparer interests, but also always tried to balance them with investor interests. So two very good board members spent eight years with us. Uh, so, you know, you become friends and it's always sad to, to say goodbye. And I hope that in the near future, we can still uh, invite them back for a proper uh, farewell because we were not able to do that uh, this time. Fortunately, we already found uh, the successor for uh, Gary, an American board member again, uh, Zach Guest. Uh, he has a strong uh, investment uh, background. His last function was uh, that he was um, uh, working for the Center for Financial Research and Analysis, the CFRA in the United States, which is basically a provider of independent investment research. So he will join the board with um, a strong investment uh, background, which is good for the board. Uh, we have had a bit of an underrepresentation of investor um, perspective in the, in the board in, in, in the last couple of years. Now we have two 
board members with a strong investment uh, investor uh, background. So we really look forward to, to working with them. Thank you, Hans. And then the second piece of news is that we've recently announced our first ever entirely virtual conference due to take place wherever you are in September. Sue, can you fill us in? Sure. So the IFRS Foundation Virtual Conference is going to combine our usual annual IFRS Foundation Conference and the World Standard Setters Conference, which we hold each year. Um, and we're doing this in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated restrictions on physical conferences. That's the reason, but it's a great opportunity to create an event that will provide the same information content, but also networking opportunities that you will you would have normally experienced by attending one of our conferences, but this will be in a virtual setting. So it will be a fantastic opportunity for you to hear directly from board members and from the staff on the latest developments in IFRS standards on the, and on the major consultations that we're taking place. But it won't just be sitting listening to us. There'll be interactive Q&A sessions, there'll be panel discussions, and there'll even be virtual networking opportunities with your uh, fellow delegates and speakers in a chat room environment. So. I'm quite excited, actually, to see how this works. It could be a good model for us going forward, even when we are hopefully back in a normal world. I think it's going to be a great event, and anyone interested in registering for it can find out more information on our website. Um, thank you, Sue and Hans, for joining me today. That's it for the June edition of the IASB Update podcast. You can find all our episodes at ifres.org, on YouTube, or on your podcast player. You'll also find the full ISB updates and the updated work plan on our website, ifres.org. If you have any comments on this podcast, please email communications at ifres.org. Until next time, keep well.